Jason is also the president of Firestarters Incorporated, a company created to ignite sustainable change in individuals and corporations. His first book, Star Firestarters, is due out this fall and chronicles the journeys of five people who challenged their fears, built a tribe of supporters, and found success beyond their wildest imagination. And in the midst of all these things, Jason makes time to be a devoted husband of 20 years, a proud father of three, a distance runner, a music leader, and along with his wife, a certified group fitness instructor. So please join me in welcoming Jason Barnaby. Good morning. So I, I happened to notice while everyone was walking in today that we have a fairly active group in the house. Is that, is that, can I say that, active? Yeah, okay, good. Because if you said no, this next part was not going to work. So that's good. I'm going to need your help before we get started to end this address when I get finished. And there's going to be some... There's going to be two things you need to look for, and they need to happen together, one after the other, and that's when you jump in. So what I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to whisper something, and then I'm going to put my hands out for you. And when I put my hands out, that is your cue to say these two words, hold on. So we're going to practice that just so everybody's on the same page, okay? So we'll pretend that we're at the end. I think it's going to work. And after that, by the way, you can explode in applause because that would be the perfect moment for you to do that. <laughs> I am fortunate to have been a, a strategies instructor for Harrison College for several sections of students. And it was one of the greatest honors that I have had as a as an education professional in my 20 years of teaching. You all are so passionate. When you came into my class, it was so much fun to get these emails. Mr. Barnaby, I got my new laptop. I got some new pens and some notebooks, and I'm excited. I downloaded some apps on the phone. I, I checked out the website. I'm ready to go. And it was so exciting for me to see that you all were excited. And then you started school. And it was like, hold on, what? I got to do homework? I can't just play on this new laptop that I have? My boss isn't suddenly understanding that I'm trying to get my education on and, like, change into a different person? What is happening? Hold on. I wasn't sure that I was ready for this part. I'm standing in the airport in Krakow, Poland with my wife. Several years ago, we're with our six-month-old son. Our bodies are bruised and battered from shoving as much as we can possibly shove into suitcases to make the trek across the Atlantic. We've got snacks, games, music, diapers, blankies, and that was just stuff that I took for me. <laughs> and as we're standing there and we get ready, we get onto the plane. I'm holding my six-month-old son on my chest in a baby carrier, and I look down. He's got these huge, big, brown eyes. And I whisper, and I say, hold on, Jaker. We're off on a great adventure. Well, those words, hold on, echoed in my ear when we landed in London and found out that our connecting flight once we landed in the States had been canceled. And I'm like, canceled? And we're in London. And she's like, yes, canceled. I'm like, hold on, what does that mean? When I, get to, when I get back to the States, what does that mean? Keys clacking, keys clacking, keys clacking. Well, sir, it means that you're going to have a five to seven hour layover in Atlanta. Have a nice day. I'm like, are you kidding me? So we get on the plane, fast forward to the other side of the Atlantic. The five-hour layover, if any of you have ever traveled, it's never five hours. It wasn't five hours. I don't know how long it was, but I didn't sleep very well because we've got a six-month-old, like some I think I might hear in the audience today. You know what that's like not to get any sleep. So we 
get to Atlanta. I don't know how many of you have been to Atlanta. We were in Atlanta in sometime in July. Yeah, you've been there then. It was hot. I mean, it was hot in the airport. We get on the airplane. We are in the very back row. The very back row. And we get on, and I've got my son on my chest. We're exhausted. We still have to go to Chicago, and then we still have to drive to Indianapolis. We start to take off out onto the, out onto the, uh, term, out of the terminal, onto the tarmac to get on the runway, and the plane comes to a screeching halt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please hold on. We have some mechanical difficulties. We're just going to sit on the tarmac for a moment and uh, see what we can do. This is your captain. Just hold on, please. I'm like, are you kidding me? So we're here. The next thing, we're on the tarmac, and we start to notice that the vents along the side of the airplane on the inside start dripping water. That's not normal. So we're sitting there, and I'm in the very back, and I'm listening to the flight attendant's talk, and she goes, okay, here, you have this, you have this, you have this. The flight attendants walk out with stacks of three-fold paper towels and rolls of scotch tape. Now, I don't know how many of you have flown. I've flown a lot. That's never been part of any pre-flight speech that I've ever heard before. They hand us the paper towels and the scotch tape and say, please tape these paper towels to the ceiling of the plane. We haven't even taken off yet, folks. So we're obedient, and we start taping paper towels to the top of the plane. We're still sitting there cooking. We're in the back row, and all of a sudden, the door flies open on the tarmac, and this wave of Atlanta jet stream heat comes in and melts that tape that we had just tried to so painstakingly put up on the ceiling. Turns out there was a lady on the plane that was having an asthma attack, and they had to get her off the plane out the back. So we're sitting there for the 20 minutes that they're trying to get her off with this heat just blowing, and people are getting cranky. People are getting cranky. And so we finally, they, they get her off the plane. We're, we're finally closed up. We start, to, we start to move again, and then... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Unfortunately, we've lost our place in line when we asked that passenger to get off the plane. We're going to have to go back to the gate. I look at my wife, and I'm like, are you kidding me? She's like, honey, just hold on. It'll be okay. So we get back. They decide after about another half an hour of us being on the plane that they want us to get off the plane so they can figure out why it was leaking and dripping and all those things. By this time, my six-month-old, who was screaming for a good part of this time, has finally fallen asleep, and the flight attendant has mercy on us, and she says, you just sleep. We'll come back and get you. Or when everybody else gets on the plane, it'll be okay. If any flight attendant ever tells you that, don't say okay. <laughs> because we fell asleep. We've been traveling for about 20 hours at this point, and we fell asleep hard. And you would think that when we woke up, it was to the soothing voice of our flight attendant offering us a refreshing beverage. Oh, it was not that. It was the sound of a vacuum cleaner bumping into our seat. They forgot us. We opened our eyes, and the lady who was vacuuming opened her eyes, and she said, what are you doing here? We said, what are you doing here? And she said, you have to get off the plane. We're like, duh. We don't even know where we're supposed to be going. We get to the end of the plane. The manager's standing there. Radios are crackling. Everybody's in a panic. You got to go. You, they moved your plane to another gate and another terminal, and it leaves in 10 minutes. Why were you on the plane? I'm like, you told us to be on the plane. <laughs> so we get off. We jump into a box truck. I'm not kidding. It had one seat. For the driver. <laughs> Laquisha was her name. She's 5'2", weighs about 93 pounds, and she's like, I'm going to get you all to where you need to go. <laughs> Sit down. Hold on. So my wife is 
clutching my son in the front of this box truck, holding on to whatever she can hold on to. I'm hanging on to a cargo net in the back of this box truck, and LaQuisha hits the gas. And she's just, I'm going to get you there. Oh, your baby's so cute. Where y'all from? I'm like, LaQuisha, watch the road. <laughs> and we are flying down this tarmac. She's like, oh, yeah, we're going to get you there. No. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> slams on the brakes. I am not kidding you. A plane went right in front of our box truck taking off. And now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure that this was a United flight. <laughs> so we stop, and she looks, and she goes, whoo, we almost died. Hold on. <laughs> and we're rolling. We get to the new terminal and the new gate. The stroller's already been packed, but they're like, y'all got to go. So they got a wheelchair waiting for us. I throw my wife and my kid in the wheelchair, and I'm pushing this thing, and we are huffing. They're like, the plane's going to leave in five minutes. You better hurry. I'm running like an Olympic sprinter. I'm like, okay, 27, 26, 25. There's the gate. I see it. I run. I get there. I'm like, oh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, flight 517 to Chicago has been delayed. Please hang on. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. We finally did make it to Chicago. My parents were waiting for us. They drove us back to Indianapolis when we got home. And when we got home and we walked in the living room and we dropped our bags, I looked at my, li my wife and I said, we did it. <laughs> and this is a time in the program where I want you all to look around to the people that are sitting next to you and throw some high fives and say, we did it. Now, I want you all who are sitting over here to take a look over here and up there. And I want you all to tell them you did it. Finally, right? So this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen alone. You, you know this who are sitting over here, and you know this who are sitting over here. This doesn't happen alone. It takes a tribe of people to get around you, to encourage you when you're tired, to encourage you when you're afraid, to keep going. Last year, my wife and I took a quick trip to Sedona, Arizona, and we decided while we were there, we were going to hike this thing called Bell Rock aptly named because it looks like a big bell. What they don't tell you is that when you're walking along Bell Rock, on the other side is about a 50 to 100 foot or 200 foot drop straight down. And there's no guardrails, no hand things, no nothing. And so we're walking most of the time kind of leaning on the rock like this because if we do this, we're falling. And it was the craziest thing. I've hiked a lot in my life. I've never experienced this. It was one of those things where if you took a step all you could really see was the next step. So like if I'm at the end of this stage right here, I could see that step, but I couldn't see the other two. It looked like it dropped off into an abyss that went on forever and that I was going to die. So I wasn't really excited to take that next step. And of course, my wife was not willing to lead. So I'm the one in front. Honey, you just go ahead. I'll see what happens once you've taken that step. Okay, dear. So I'm walking. And literally, it was one of those things where we would come around a bend, and it looked like if I took the step, I was falling off the end of the canyon. And the coolest thing happened. This other couple that were about our age came around the other way, which, by the way, we had tried and said, no, oh, we're not going that way. It's too scary. So we came back around. And they said, oh, are you guys going to go all the way around? And we said, uh, probably not. It looks pretty scary. And they said, oh, it's okay. You can do it. You just have to take the next step. Because when you take that next step, it opens up some things that you can't see. And once you get to that next part, you see that actually it's not that scary at all. There's like five steps that are real flat. But you wouldn't know that unless you took that next step. And we said, yeah, but what about that really high scary part that's back there that we turned around at? And they go, oh, no, you can do that. Really? My wife's like, yeah, honey, you can try it first. 
So that's what we did, and I'll tell you what, we made it. And it was the most amazing feeling to be finished with that and to know that we did it. That we put one foot in front of the next, in front of the next, and it was amazing as we did that how easy it was. But I'm telling you, at that place where we met those people, we didn't want to take the next step. And we took their encouragement, and we took their excitement, and we said, all right, I think we can do it. That's what you all are to these graduates that are here today. Graduates, that's what you are to one another. Because you're not, this is not the end of your journey. This is the beginning of your journey. You're standing on that place and you're saying, uh -huh, it's been kind of comfortable just being a student for a while. For some of you. <laughs> Remember, I was an instructor, so I know what I'm talking about. Encourage each other. You are not in this alone. This place is packed. There's, there's way more of them than there are of you. They are here because of you. You are here because of them. And it's that tribe that we get together and we encourage one another to take that next step even when we're afraid. So why do I tell you this story about this hellish journey from across the Atlantic and this scary hike around Arizona. Sometimes in this life, we are given tools that are not adequate, like scotch tape and paper towels. And we're asked to do a job. My challenge to you is that you do the best with what you can, with what you have, where you are. Sometimes, you're going to feel left alone and forgotten like we felt at the back of that plane. And in that moment, you need a LaQuisha moment. You need somebody to get you from point A to B in a hurry and get your heart restarted. That's what you need. And so for those of you that are sitting next to somebody, you need to look at them and say, I'll be your LaQuisha. Now you laugh, but somebody's going to call you one of these days and say, I need you to be my LaQuisha in this context so we're all clear and you know what we're talking about. Here's the other thing. Sometimes the journey is the destination and sometimes the destination is the journey. Travel through this world with your eyes wide open and don't ever, ever stop learning, ever. And sometimes you're going to be put in situations like we were several times on that journey from Poland to America where we had no control over anything. The time we leave, the plane we're on, what we have to drink or eat, we had control over nothing except our reactions and our behaviors. And I challenge you, and I challenge you, and I challenge you to act in such a way with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and understanding and self-control in such a way that you surprise the people that you interact with. And sometimes you're going to be on a, on a road in life that's going to scare the crap out of you. And I challenge you to take that next step, and then another, and then another. Because graduates, this is life. And it's not a question of if life is going to happen. It's a question of when life happens, what is it that you do? How do you react? But here's the cool thing. You guys already know the answer. You've known the answer since you became students at the Chef's Academy and at Harrison College. You gather your tribe around you. You take that next step, as scary as it might be, and you hold on. Graduates of 2017, you are off on a great adventure.
Thank you.